Chapter 9 The shadows were getting longer, making deep pockets of darkness. I closed my eyes to picture Ezra's map and tried to calm myself. I wouldn't have the sun to guide me, and many of the landmarks would be hidden by darkness. The moon, I recalled, was showing about half of itself then, but it wouldn't be rising until later. I had to rely on my memory of a journey taken once in the dark and once in daylight. I'd have to keep my wits about me, as Pa always said. I couldn't let fear get the best in my good sense. Pa said that when a man led, let his mind get full of something strong like fear or anger, he couldn't think straight. Think of Pa, I told myself. Think of Molly and Ezra and Duffy and Wynn and how they're waiting for you. Think of Mama and how she's watching over you and keeping you safe. Think of anything except the darkness and weasel. I took advantage of the last bit of daylight to run fast and cover as much ground as I could. But finally I had to slow down as it became very dark. A few, a few stars shone down through the clear, cold air, and a breeze began to sweep through the trees, rustling the leaves and swaying the branches. The night was coming alive. I heard the cry of the night hawk, and later the hoo, 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 hoo of the great horned owl. As I passed through a stand of hickory trees, I disturbed a group of turkeys who were roosting in the upper branches. They sounded huge as they flew off, crashing through the trees and landing on the ground. When I moved on, I could hear them calling to one another so they could gather again for the night. Every once in a while, I heard the steps of larger animals moving away from me in the forest. I didn't really belong in their nighttime world. If I concentrated hard with all my senses alert, I was able to move pretty quickly through the night forest. I may not be very quiet, but I reckon I'm going as fast as Ezra could, I thought proudly. After a while, the moon came up, and its light made the going even faster. I was feeling confident and strong. I couldn't even, f I could f even forget the hunger gnawing at my stomach and the urge to look back over my shoulder. Ahead, their steep sides gleaming silver in the moonlight, were the cliffs that rose high above the big river, where we had stopped to rest with e and eat with Ezra. I felt a smile of satisfaction creep over my face. I had found my way. Only a little over an hour, and I'd be at Ezra's. I'd sit by the warm fire, eat some stew. Pa would be awake. He'd lie in his bed and listen while I told him about my jury. He'd be proud. I'd see the same pride in Ezra's eyes and Molly's. Suddenly, my thoughts were interrupted by the sharp snap of a twig behind me. I stopped. I'd become accustomed to the noises of the night and its creatures, and this was new and different. There was something strange, something stealthy about the sudden utter silence. I waited and, not hearing nothing else, began to walk again, then stopped quickly and listened. There was a rustle of footsteps in the leaves, then silence. Whatever was behind me was behaving the way Pa and I did when we were stalking game. I was being stalked like an animal. My heart began to beat in a fast, skittery way, and I could feel prickles down the back of my neck. I realized that I was now near the very place where we were sitting when Ezra spotted Weasel. Slowly and quietly, I slipped behind a rock that jutted out from the cliff. With one hand, I reached behind into my pack until I felt the thick, rounded end of the hunting stick Ezra had given me. Slowly, slowly I drew it out of the pack, sliding it through my hand until I held the narrower end as Ezra had done. I waited. The silence stretched on. It lasted so long I was beginning to distrust my memory. Had I really heard what I thought I heard, or was it my imagination? I had about decided I was have been mistaken and was fixing to step onto the path again when a voice broke the silence and stillness and sent a chill racing down my spine. You gonna hide there all night, boy? I stood frozen. I was so afraid I thought maybe fear was something I could die of right there and then. What's this? Some yellow-bellied shawnee trick you learned from that white engine? There was a hoot of laughter. Then the voice took on a different tone, sounding friendly, but not so I believed it. You come on out here and show yourself, boy. I shifted slightly so I could see between the cliff wall and the large rock that stood between me and the voice. 
In the path stood a dim figure. Moonlight shone brightly on a shock of white hair and on the barrel of a rifle, making them stand out brilliantly in the darkness. Weasel with Pa's gun, just like in my dream. My dream hadn't told me what happened next, so I just stayed still. The voice became harsh again and angry. You come on out here, boy, now. I ain't got time to play games. I've seen every engine trick there is, and I'm still standing right here now, ain't I? So just show yourself, and maybe you won't have to get hurt. I didn't answer. It seemed to me I was safe as long as I stayed where I was. How long can we stand here like this, I wondered. And as if I had smoke, spoke, spoken out loud, Weasel growled, I'm tired of playing with you, boy. He began walking slowly toward my hiding place. The rifle pointed right at me. I'd been holding Ezra's hunting stick so tight my fingers felt numb. I drew the stick back in the throwing position and wiggled my fingers to make sure they still worked. Weasel was about twenty yards away. I didn't know how far I could throw the stick, but I knew I didn't want him to get any closer. I drew a deep breath and jumped out into the narrow path. Focusing on the gleaming rifle, I threw the stick. The last thing I remember was hearing a rifle shot and a long, loud scream, and wondering if it was my voice or Weasel's.